Welcome, everybody. We'll give a few, uh, another minute or so. Let everybody in the room. Hope everybody's having a wonderful Friday. After Easter weekend, this should be the relaxation weekend, right? Everybody had all those family functions. And <laughs> all right, well, I'm Ryan Coleman, president of National RIA. Welcome everyone to the RIA Now um, call for April the 22nd. Um, we have uh, some great information for you guys today. Um, we have uh, John Bowens and Jeff Seals. They're gonna be talking about everything from investing uh, with your IRA, some maybe some cryptocurrency conversations as well. Of course, we have our CEO, Charles Tassel, who's going to be giving us some very important legislative updates. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our executive director, Rebecca McLean. Thanks, Ryan. Just a quick disclaimer, although we definitely are going to be talking about financial concepts today, we're not giving financial advice, nor are we giving legal advice. And if you need those two things, then you need to see your local advisors and have them help you with any decisions that you need to be making. We are here, of course, to promote, educate, um, promote, protect, and educate as we have been for many years, since 1983 officially. Uh, we have over 120 local chapters and at those local chapters, you can actually become a member and take advantage of our great member programs of which one of our sponsors, Home Depot Pro is one. Our special programs with them include rebate programs, discounts like 20% off paint uh, and other special programs such as appliance and cabinet programs. So please make sure that you connect with one of our locals and take advantage of those benefits. You can find the locals that you're looking for at our um, website at nationalrea.org. You can go here to find, a, you click on I'm an investor, click on find a uh, local RIA and you'll be able to um, get access to those terrific benefits that we have. But I am not gonna take any more of your time. I'm gonna turn it over to Charles Tassel to give you a quick legislative update and then we'll get on to the heart of the program. All right, thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, couple of quick things and I wanna just mention this. I've said this before, um, Chicken Little. Everybody remembers the story of Chicken Little and how it ran around, the sky's falling, the sky's falling. Well, many of you are aware that there are organizations out there that will use Chicken Little tactics to raise money, to do different things. And especially in this, right now, this time frame as we've coming out of the pandemic, things are reopening. We're seeing more chicken little syndrome. And that is from a legislative front to marketing to all that in part, because let's face it, what's gonna happen in the economy tomorrow, next week, next month, next year is anybody's guess. And that's giving rise and giving some breathing space for chicken littles. Um, that also is, is a way of giving space for chicken littles in the legislative front. Bills that are not actually moving, but have been introduced. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in Ohio, we have a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican governor. So if it's a Democrat bill, it's probably not going anywhere. And yet, two Democrats entered a bill that said, hey, we're going to make uh, do source of income. And we want to make sure source of income is included, so it's, it's protected, so that you have to accept Section 8 no matter what. And immediately, a couple of groups started saying, oh, this is going to pass in Ohio. We've got to do all these things. And it's like, no, it's not. It's not going anywhere. In fact, it might get one committee hearing just out of courtesy. Uh, and this is where I want to bring everybody's attention back to kind of Bill Track programs. And we have Bill Track 50 in our advocacy. If you look on National RIA, um, dot org. And we have our bill track 50 section in there and we do tracking of bills. And I really encourage you to make sure you're tracking bills, do the research, do not send money to these organizations that are out there just saying, hey, there's a bill in California that's going to end everything. Well, guess what? California enters bills all the time. Um, and in fact, I'll give you a, a side note. I believe it's Alabama that actually literally there are thousands of bills entered every single year because that's part of how their politics work there. Very few actually pass. It's something like 0.2%. So just because a bill is introduced doesn't mean it's going anywhere. Even if it has one hearing, doesn't mean it's going anywhere. Make sure you're plugged in and hearing 
what the real pulse of your community and your state are and not responding to the chicken little. So I'll just say that to start off with. And again, California has been um, kind of a hot spot for some of that recently. So I just wanna make everybody aware of that. Uh, one of the things I will say is this year is probably gonna be one of the largest log jams, um, politically speaking, legislatively speaking, I've mentioned this before, there's not a lot moving forward on bills, but we are seeing regulations moving forward. Um, there's a couple of regulations we're working on. The Housing Coalition has put forward some different efforts and raised awareness. Uh, HUD is in process of uh, putting more information out and receiving information, and we'll be participating in some of those comments uh, probably in about a month and a half to two months is when it's next one's expected. So there'll be, when that comes out, we'll reach out to everybody and basically use our voter voice process that we can actually directly interact with and communicate with HUD. So every individual can have a pre-written, pre-drafted letter that they'll be able to send in on those regulations. So just FYI on that. Um, one thing I will mention is keep an eye out locally. Again, short-term rentals have been on the radar for quite a few years, but with uh, COVID and part of this just bluntly behind the scenes, the raw politics of it, short-term rentals picked up quicker than hotels did. So the hotel uh, industry has said, hey, we need to go after these guys. And so they've been pushing legislation to make sure that the short-term rental folks are either on parity with them or more realistically, um, not at parity with them and you're trying to push them out of the market to make sure that they're keep protecting their market. So keep an eye out for short-term rental legislation. Part of the reason for it is typically it'll be over expansive of what it really needs to be and making sure that members, you know, they, you've got members that are engaged and able to help on that issue. So just heads up on that. As I did mention, our voter voice, HR 5013, if you go to uh, nationalria.org and go to our voter voice section, we do have a uh, section on there and encourage you to ask your congressman to be a co-sponsor on HR 5013. Um, it's, it's the seller finance bill. There's an explanation on there what it is. And it's this is one that's actually, we're starting to get a little more traction on it, albeit, as I said, this is a log jam year, but we can lay some good groundwork and keep building, which is what you have to do with legislation sometimes. So um, the last thing I will give you, and, and this is not a chicken little piece, I just want to please remind you, cyber attacks are up through the roof right now. Uh, whether it's a phishing, and by phishing, I mean, you get an email that says, hey, a friend of mine just the other day, your bank account was just addressed such and such. Click here to check on. Well, don't click. <laughs> please do not ever click through those emails. Check them third party. Go to your own app. Do not click through the emails. Um, I would also encourage to make sure that you've got good computer backups and make sure that that is available. The, the viruses that are out there are man-made, of course, but these are very malicious and there's a real push on them right now. So just encourage everyone to make sure you've got good computer backups, backing up your documents, um, especially your tax documents and all that. Save yourselves a lot of hassle right now. So just FYI for everyone on that. And Rebecca, I will turn it back over to you. I will just echo, by the way, uh, what you're saying about cyber attacks. An organization on which I serve on their board just got a letter from the FBI and um, their remote access had been compromised and was being sold on the dark web. So if you're using PC anywhere or anything like that, just be aware that Charles is right. It's crazier than ever. So um, just be careful. I'm sorry, Rebecca, could you repeat that? Charles is right. Did you say that? And it is Thank being everyone. recorded. It's <laughs> Take care. So thanks, Charles. Um, and now what we've been waiting for, I know we've got a lot of questions for John, everything from um, crypto, which has been crazy. And we had a session on that at the end of last year. Um, and then we're having he and Jeff talk about some of the questions you had about being able to use your IRA for uh, investing in things like ground floor. So John, I'm going to let you start kind of give an overview about some of the alternative things that uh, equity supports our investors in investing in um, and how, the, how they've kind of added some things to make it easier to work with some of our benefit providers as well. And then we'll, we'll hop on with Jeff and, and talk about how we can work together. Okay, outstanding. Hey, I appreciate it so much, Rebecca and Charles and Ryan and the rest of the group with National RIA. 
Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Equity Trust, we're, we're a self-directed IRA custodian. Uh, so we're the folks that can help you use an IRA or 401k or other retirement plan to invest in real estate. Um, looking at the names, it appears that um, just about everybody on today's call is familiar with, with our, for, our firm, our organization, and, and what we do. Uh, so I'll jump right into some of the topics of, of discussion today. And uh, certainly we'll cover uh, ground floor in terms of how you can potentially use your IRA or 401k to plug into those investments. Uh, but I'll start with talking about uh, some of the, uh, and I'll jump right into uh, Rebecca, what you had asked about, which is the ability to be able to pay for expenses related to your IRA owned properties. So one of the biggest challenges that we have, we've observed over the last, really I call it 20 years, with owning real estate in an IRA is the logistics of paying for expenses. And so when this whole business started, call it 20, 25 years ago, you would call up Equity Trust and you would over the phone request a check and we would send a check out. Uh, and then things moved online where we had the ability to allow a client to log online and initiate a bill pay where they would have funds sent via check from their IRA directly to a, an account of their choosing. And that's how they would pay for expenses. Uh, and then those checks would go directly to a contractor or to pay for taxes, insurance, whatever it is that they're paying for. And uh, although that's accommodating, uh, at times it, investors find that to be a, a, a nuisance, uh, cumbersome. It, it takes a little bit more time than they're used to. And so what we recently launched is a debit card capability. Uh, we call it the prepaid expense pass, uh, but it's essentially a debit card tied to your IRA. And what that enables an investor to do is to simply with their equity trust IRA enroll in this prepaid card system. And they receive this prepaid card electronically or plastic version or both. And so if somebody wants to carry around a card, they have the ability to do that. If they want it simply in electronic format, they have the ability to do that as well. And so think when you need to pay for a washer and dryer or a refrigerator, materials, uh, even an occasional expense that comes up where you may need to go to Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards, wherever you may shop. Uh, we're going to use Home Depot specifically on this program. And you have the ability to be able to pay for that expense rather than waiting for a check. And so we had seen over the last 15 years in particular, a number of clients who have experienced challenges in maintaining their, their IRA on rental property. And so now we have the ability for a customer to have access to this prepaid card. And even more importantly, given our relationship with National RIA and Home Depot, uh, we have the ability to allow those individual customers to set that account up where in that prepaid card where they can add that to their Home Depot profile. Uh, so now when they go to Home Depot and they purchase materials, uh, they're gonna be able to obviously get credit for those materials through their Home Depot Pro account, which obviously adds to the, their rebates and their other, um, you know, the, their other uh, benefits that they get as a National RIA member and uh, a Home Depot Pro account holder. So we're, uh, we're really excited about that. Uh, we just launched this. We've already seen a, a ton of adoption. And uh, we like to say it's, um, it's essentially putting your self-directed IRA uh, in your back pocket where you have the ability to utilize this, this virtual wallet and uh, be able to pay for expenses. So we, we fully anticipate our customers here at Equity Trust uh, leveraging the program uh, leveraging their national RIA membership and their ability to utilize that debit card or prepaid card at Home Depot for their various expenses, uh, which in turn, uh, we should see an increase in, in expenses to self-directed IRAs. Uh, and when I say that, I mean those expenses uh, at vendors like Home Depot, who we have a great relationship with. So uh, excited about that excited to continue to build the relationship with National RIA and Home Depot and our customers to be able to utilize that service. Uh, so that's really, on behalf of the members in, in Home Depot, we really appreciate that. I know we were able to do some things just by getting our members the revolving 
uh, credit card and then paying through the portal that way. But this really makes it so much simpler and we all very much appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Um, and for those of you that don't already, uh, I personally, as a, a National RIA member, I should say I'm a, a member through my local chapter here in Cleveland. And um, I use the Home Depot app on a consistent basis to track my expenses for my IRA transactions, as well as my non-IRA transactions. And I actually have the ability to go into that app and I can flag the transactions that are uh, designated for my IRA properties versus my non-IRA transactions. So I really make sure that I keep all of that segregated. And that just helps me from a bookkeeping and a record keeping perspective. And of course, I have the peace of mind knowing that I'm ever audited, that, um, that, that you know, I have those records to back up all of those transactions. So just by the nature of the technology that Home Depot offers in the pro account, um, I've been able to, to successfully manage, again, my IRA transactions and my non-IRA transactions and in a much more efficient way than I, than I ever thought I was going to be able to do. So a lot of uh, hidden benefits there that uh, we don't necessarily talk about day in and day out here. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, a good point was raised in the chat. The traditional way to pay for an expense uses a DOI where equity trust makes sure it is not a prohibited transaction. What is the safeguard when using the debit card? Yeah, so there's, um, that's a great question because th the answer is, is that there's never going to be a, a safeguard. Um, if, if we put too many safeguards in, then it's going to become overly burdensome for our customers. So we really have to balance between the, the safeguards to protect folks from engaging in prohibited transactions and, and making things very easy for investors. And what we've learned over the last 10 to 15 years is the, the best the best line of defense is education and information. And so if you attend our, our trainings, you watch our YouTube videos, you watch our tutorials and demonstrations online, you'll learn about what prohibited transactions are. And, it, and it's pretty simple what those prohibited transactions are. You know, For example, when I go to Home Depot and I'm buying materials for my IRA transactions and I might be buying materials for my non-IRA transactions, I make sure that I segregate those orders out. And, and really what I'll say is what I try to do to my best ability with my self-directed IRAs is I don't want to pick up materials and be delivering them to the, to the job site or delivering them to my contractors. I much, would, I much rather prefer paying the contractors, the contractors pay for the materials, and then they're transporting those materials. If I have like a refrigerator, for example, that I buy from Home Depot, I'll use the prepaid card for that. And then I'll have that, of course, refrigerator delivered. Um, so I'm not touching anything. You wanna be as hands off as possible with your IRA transaction. So I try to keep those segregated and then don't get tempted. You know, you might say, well, it's just a, a Dasani water bottle and a monster and a Snickers bar <laughs> when you're going through, through the, the Home Depot line. Um, one could argue that that is a prohibited transaction. And yes, there could be a point in time in the future where someone is audited and they're actually challenged on that. So try to be as hands-off as possible. We're not going to be able to have a control in place, but that's where we provide education and information so investors are making an informed decision. And John, what if I have a property manager or a contractor and that's my way of being hands-off so that I'm not actually doing the work. I'm not making, I'm not driving to Home Depot myself. I'm not physically making the purchase myself, but I'm handing them my um, IRA debit card. Is that prohibited? Uh, it, it, that's not prohibited, no. Uh, the rule of thumb that's used in terms of what you can and cannot do, and again, this is a rule of thumb, is you can do the desk work, but you shouldn't be doing the physical sweat equity. There are some investors that are very risk adverse. They're very conservative. They don't want any questions whatsoever if they were ever audited. And so they prefer to take the completely passive approach where they hire a property manager. That property manager is handling all of the operational aspects of the property. And then their IRA is simply collecting a net rental proceeds check on a monthly basis or using our direct deposit system 
where the property manager sends funds direct deposit into the IRA, which is another tool or feature to the equity trust IRA that investors can take advantage of. And you really want to look at this through the lens of a, a, the logical approach. If, if I own 20 rental properties in my self-directed IRA and the total portfolio value is $5 million, that's likely going to be looked at a lot differently than the singular rental property at $75,000, where maybe I am handling exclusively the administrative oversight, and then I am hiring out contractors when physical work needs to be done. So we can't tell you which way is the appropriate way because we don't even necessarily know. Uh, the questions that come up with regard to what I can and cannot do, these laws haven't even necessarily been written yet. Now, there's some framework with respect to the Internal Revenue Code 4975. There's the aspect of services to the IRA. What does services mean? Well, we have some directional sense in terms of what services mean, but we don't have an exact, okay, it's all right for you to talk to a tenant but it's not okay for you to step foot on the property. Those types of, of aspects, we, we don't per se have an exact yes or no answer to. So we follow this rule of thumb of you want to stay away from the sweat equity and stick to just the desk duties if you're going to own IRA rental properties. All of that being said, there are many investors that uh, choose the much more passive approach where instead of owning real estate in their IRA, they take the approach of private lending or investing in already performing notes. Uh, occasionally we do see the non-performing note elements come into self-directed IRAs, but, but generally it's gonna be a performing either commercial loan or even could be a performing uh, owner-occupied mortgage. Uh, I personally can tell you that a part of my strategy from an investment perspective is private lending, primarily to real estate flippers. So these are real estate investors that I meet at my local real estate investor association meetings that I attend on a monthly basis. I find rehabbers that are pro rehabbers that have done this before, that have a track record. They need financing. They see my financing as much more competitive than some of the hard money lenders. No disrespect to the hard money lenders because there's certainly opportunities for that type of financing given the situation because I don't have the financial backing that the hard money lenders do. But if the deal makes sense and the opportunity timing is right, then I use my self-directed IRA and I deploy that capital to a real estate investor and I'm making an attractive rate of return that in many cases is better than what I could be making in the traditional financial markets. And I feel that that's a more secure way to grow my retirement plan. So for those out, th those out there that are you know, maybe concerned with respect to the prohibited transaction rules, which is a very, very serious matter, um, then you may want to look at a little different approach where you either A, hire a property manager, or B, you look to a different real estate investment strategy whether that's private lending or note investing, or even investing in a real estate partnership with another group of investors, or as I know what we're gonna talk about is opportunities like for example, ground floor, where you can invest into a instrument that is supported by technology where you're completely hands-off, you're completely passive. And I almost view it as akin to investing in a, let's say, publicly traded uh, bond or a publicly traded bond fund or a publicly traded mutual fund or stock where you're simply doing the desk work, you're doing your due diligence, you're clicking a mouse and you're processing a transaction and, and you're limiting your scope of duties to those specific items. Awesome, two other quick questions. One is speaking of other strategies for those that are buying at auction, um, they're curious, is there a limit to that card? It, could they actually use it to buy at auction? Uh, so that's a good, we need to define what that card is used for. That card is used exclusively for expenses related to a property that you own in your IRA. Now the question, and this is a very common question, which is, well, how can I buy properties at auctions? Uh, what if I wanna, what if I want to do a VRBO or Airbnb type property in my IRA? What are my options there? Well, 
Airbnb and VRBO short-term rentals um, open up a, a whole nother discussion in terms of self-directed IRAs that, you know, obviously we don't have time to get into today, but I will share my screen with, for just a moment and give all of the viewers an example of what you can do with your self-directed IRA if you want to buy properties at auctions. Uh, maybe you're in a situation where you need very fast access to the self-directed IRA cash and you can't necessarily wait for a custodian like Equity Trust to process the transaction uh, or place a direction of investment and go through the paperwork necessary to process these investments. So what I'm going to share with you, I, I want to make sure everybody's very careful if they use this type of structure, because you are putting yourself in a situation where there's, there's more, I'll call it unfettered control. And so you got to make sure that you're very detailed in what you're doing and you put in the right controls in place so that you don't engage in a prohibited transaction. So the diagram that I'm sharing with you here is an IRA owned LLC. So here's what you would do. You would form an LLC. Your IRA would be the 100% owner of that LLC. You would appoint a third party manager. This is really important. A third party manager. Who can that manager be? It could be anyone that is not a disqualified person. Disqualified person would be you, your spouse, your children, your parents, for all intents and purposes, your immediate family members. So that could be a brother, that could be a sister, that could be an aunt, uncle, that could be even better, an investor friend of yours, a financial friend is your manager of your IRA owned LLC. So this is a manager managed LLC, not a member managed LLC. Because see, if you put yourself in the driver's seat here, you put yourself as the manager of that IRA owned LLC, not that today it's considered a prohibited transaction, but you could put yourself in a position of risk. So you add a layer of insulation there, you have your third party manager, your IRA money from equity trust is directed to the LLC bank account that you form. So you're going to form a bank account for the LLC. Your IRA cash is going to go to that LLC bank account. And now when you buy a property at auction or you need to link your bank account up to the Airbnb technology system, or uh, whatever it is that you might be doing in terms of real estate investing, you're doing that all through the LLC IRA. And then when you choose to, you would send monies directly back into the self-directed IRA. So this can be a really great way for those of you that need the fast access to cash. You want to do investments that are maybe a little bit more creative. Um, and as Jeff is going to talk about ground floor, I'm sure in a moment here, this can also be a way for you to more easily plug into technology systems like ground floor to make your investments in a much more efficient manner. Now, again, you have to proceed with caution. You want to be very detailed in keeping good records when you use this type of system. Because remember, equity trust is no longer going to have oversight of every debit and every credit, every asset that you buy, every asset that you sell. So you want to make sure you keep very good records. So that way, if you're ever audited, you can produce to that auditor all of your expenses and you can account for every dollar that was used for every investment, making sure that the IRA paid for that asset, the IRA paid for any fix up and repairs. And then of course, all of your profit went back into your IRA. After all, these are tax efficient accounts. So we wanna make sure we maintain the integrity of those tax efficient accounts. Awesome, another quick question is, is there any cost to the debit card or a fee? Uh, yes, so if you are a, standard equity trust client call it, um, a, you would pay a $50 fee to enroll in the card. It's only a one-time fee. Uh, we don't have any nuisance charges, meaning every time you want to load up more money to the card, we don't charge you extra fees for that. If you're a gold level service client, then you are going to receive the card for only $25. So you get a little bit of a discount. For those of you that are, are national RIA members, you know that you get access to our gold level service program for free for the first year. So you're already going to be dialed into that. You're already going to get the discount of, of $25. So for all intents and purposes, we could say on today's call that everybody's going to be able to enroll for, for $25. 
that's a one-time fee and you can request to either have a plastic card sent out to you or you can accept it by electronic means and then you would just use that account electronically. I should mention as well, Rebecca, uh, I know I as a, a property investor, uh, I, I'll use Venmo and Cash App and some of the other um, cash applications, if you will, Apple Pay, uh, but mainly Venmo to pay contractors. And that opens up obviously a whole nother discussion in terms of some of the recent changes in terms of paying contractors by, by Venmo and such. But for all intents and purposes for this conversation, I'll say that you can actually link up your prepaid card to Venmo, and then you can pay contractors uh, via that system. A lot of people ask me, can you collect rents by Venmo and then have those routed back in your equity trust account? Um, that functionality doesn't exist, but we do have a payment center where you can essentially generate a link, send it to your tenant, your tenant goes in, and they can pay their rent via direct deposit into the equity trust IRA. And the same works if you're doing private lending from your self-directed IRA and you have your borrower set up where they're making interest payments, they can use the same payment portal and route those funds via direct deposit into the IRA. Perfect. And then we have something, a um, question that's really specific. It talks about um, with your IRA, you're the number one disqualified person and then talks about what you can't do. And then goes on to say, if you're carrying a debit card to purchase items for rental within your IRA, isn't that specifically lending money, extending credit, furnishing goods, services, or facilities to your own plan? Um, so the argument of furnishing goods, services, and facilities, um, 4975A1 through B, you're certainly not extending credit. You're not lending money to yourself personally. If you were to use that prepaid card, and buy materials and then use those materials at a non IRA owned property, absolutely, that would be a, a bona fide prohibited transaction. But if you're using that strictly for your IRA owned transactions, then that would be considered acceptable. Uh, the furnishing of goods, services, and facilities that, that's a great question. And, and I appreciate this individual uh, actually referencing specific 4975 of the tax code. The challenge that we have with owning real estate in an IRA is that it's a gray area. No one has told us that you can't manage your own IRA owned rentals. At the same time, of course, no one's going to tell us that it's okay. So, so we're operating a little bit in the gray area here. And as an investor, you just have to make the decision on, are you comfortable with that? Now, what we can tell you is hundreds of thousands of clients have owned real estate in their self-directed IRAs, have managed real estate in their self-directed IRAs. They do it the right way. They don't do the physical work themselves. They just limit their scope of duties to the administrative oversight. And we've never seen any issues with that. Will there come a day where someone is challenged on the furnishing of goods, services, and facilities? Well, services and furnishing of facilities can be broadly interpreted. If I put materials in my truck and I deliver it to the job site, is that furnishing facilities? It, it possibly is, but, but that law has not really been written yet because there hasn't been any tax court cases or any IRS rulings or guidance that tells us that that is a prohibited transaction. What I will say is if somebody comes to me and says, John, can I manage the property myself, buy materials, and send it to the job site and have the contractors do the work and work with the tenants to sign leases, you'll never, you'll never hear me say that that is absolutely okay. I'm also going to, I also can't say that it's, that it's not okay. So I'm, I, I can't say yes or no to it. And, and this is the one thing that I really struggle with because my mind as an analytical person is black and white. I either do it this way or I do it that way. And that's it. And so this has been, I will tell you, the biggest struggle that I've had in this business for the past 15 years is trying to appropriately articulate this, to do it in the right way, and make sure that we're, we're communicating the right things to the right clients. What I would never want to do is tell someone, you have to use a property management company, or even worse, I've had people that say, you can't own IRA properties, you can't own rental properties in your IRA, or do a fix and flip in your IRA. And I think to myself, I'm like, well, isn't that possibly cheating somebody out of growing their retirement and being prosperous? In a way, it, it could be. 
in a way I could be ill advising them because we could, we could come, we could ultimately find out one day that this is absolutely acceptable. There could be a tax court case that says this is absolutely acceptable. There was actually a bankruptcy case that involved uh, trying to penetrate on a prohibited transaction. And uh, the courts ruled that it was acceptable what the person was doing. And they essentially had a property that they were flipping and they were paying other people to do the work. And the bankruptcy court ruled that it was acceptable. That being said, you want to be careful with that because that's bankruptcy court. That's not tax court. So we can't use that bankruptcy case and say, oh, well, that's the precedent setting case to set the law. That, that's absolutely not what I'm saying. Just giving you some, some directional sense as well uh, uh, here. Um, so very difficult question uh, to conclude and move on. I will say if you are very risk adverse, if you are reading that services aspect of 4975C1C and you say, I don't want anyone to ever question my IRA, I've been audited before maybe, and I don't want anyone to ever question this, that's where you're gonna wanna hire a property manager or don't own rental properties in your IRA, look to do private lending, look to do note investing, investments that can still grow your IRA in a very meaningful way, but you're completely hands off and you're creating an asset in your IRA that looks very much like a bond. So people have been investing in corporate bonds and treasury securities forever and ever with their IRAs since 1974 when IRAs were conceived. And a promissory note in mortgage looks very much like a corporate bond. The good news is, is it's backed by real property and not backed by company assets and potential cash flow. And that's why I like private lending and note investing with a self-directed IRA. Um, you know, this is, this is just my opinion, if you will. Um, my favorite type of investing in a self-directed IRA is private lending and note investing. Going forward, I can just tell you from a personal perspective, that is all I want to do with my self-directed IRAs, whether it's an equity participation loan, which is a little bit more creative way to lend money, or just a, a standard promissory note mortgage. Those are the types of investments that I want to be able to do going forward, but it takes time to get there. You have to build capital in that IRA to get to a point where then you can just strictly be a private lender with your self-directed retirement funds. Well, and that's a great intro now. I was going to put this off for a minute, but since you went down that road and it fits so well here, let's bring Jeff on for a minute to talk about why you don't have to build up a massive amount of cash in that IRA to be able to invest. And you can still invest in something like those security feel type of uh, assets uh, with a company like Ground Floor. So Jeff, for those who were not with us when we talked about this back in January, can you talk to us a little bit about what Ground Floor is, why it's unusual, why it fits exactly what John said, and then we'll have John talk about how an IRA can participate in that. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I mean, sir, yeah, everything John has said has actually teed uh, this conversation up quite well. And so um, Ground Floor is not, so the what ground floor has created as far as just the investment engine isn't isn't very different than the things you've seen before through acorns robin hood even all the way back to e-trade the difference is it's actually real estate that's being transacted upon right so normally um, normally you see stocks uh etfs bonds as as john said uh but in this in this instance ground floor has actually enabled you the ability to fractionally invest into real estate and so um we've been around for about 10 years and the premise of when we created ground floor or they created ground floor i certainly wasn't privy to that um, was to create an investment platform that was backed solely by real estate. And so they took it a step further and actually went and got the appropriate licensing requirements from the SEC that allows non-accredited investors to also uh, participate in this. So the entry point for ground floor is extremely low. You can log on and invest $10 um, into ground floor. <clears throat> and you can do that, like I said, fractionally. Okay, so you, you go into the platform, you can actually uh, tranche it out based on risk. Um, you know, higher risk has a higher return, right? And so um, now over a 10 year span, we've averaged right around a 10% return for our borrowers. That's a real number. Um, it's easy to do when you're lending money short term uh, interest only to purchase and rehab uh, type of investors. But um, but that's that was the premise of ground floor was to create um, something that um, anyone uh, as little as ten dollars could actually invest into real estate um, and uh, passively, as you said. Right. Um, so the money goes in. Uh, you can choose the property, um, specifically one property. You can do it across 
hundreds of properties on the on the platform at that time. Um, you can do it based on city or based on someone you know, right? That information is available or based on their experience, right? So all that information is available to you because uh, the SEC requires that we do that. Um, but uh, in order to do all that, of course, we also originate. So Groundflow is also a hard money lender, and that's where those loans come from uh, that you are investing in. So we fund them with our own dollars, um, and then we put them out. And I only say that because I want to make sure we understand it's not a crowdfunding platform. It's an investment platform. There's a difference. So we actually fund these. Uh, we put them out to the investment platform and through a security called LRO. So it's a limited recourse obligation. Um, you, you then fractionally invest in those. And then we, of course, recapture that capital and continue to do it again. Um, but that's that's kind of high level of ground floor, uh, and it's, that is what we do. Um, and so it does, like a like like you guys, like we've been talking about. It is a it is a very very low entry point based on cost, uh, based on effort. Um, it's uh, is as close to private lending, I guess, as you could get uh, without actually participating in it um, uh, 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 holistically. But, um, but yeah, that, that's ground floor. So I'm going to have Lori put up the URL really quickly. Jeff, if you want to say it, then Lori will, will type it. And then if you'll put your contact info in. Um, sure. But what are some of the more popular investments that you see people um, investing in, especially, I don't know if, if you can tell from your side, who's investing with what, but uh, can, if you've seen people or have had people talk about what they're doing with their IRAs, can you uh, give us some insight into that? I mean, yeah, so the, the investment for the most part, it, it, it looks all the same, right? So we certainly can, you can invest through your IRA, but um, how you invest is really just the really just the one way, uh, aside from our, our, our stairs app, which I'll speak to in a moment, but, um, but it's, um, you know, like I said, it, it, there's, there's no, there's, there's no, um, significant entry point to get in um, and you can do it across any any number of properties or just one and so that's most people just go in and they add, they they pick they pick minimum risk they get 10 percent return um, and they, as soon as they pick that one tranche it goes across a couple hundred properties um, so it's it's very much kind of a click of a button once you're in you're in um, the money stays tied up until disposition right so that money it could be six months when it turns around it could be I mean, it could it could go past maturity. It could be 15, 16, 17 months. And so, uh, and if that happens, that's actually ends up being a pretty good thing for you because then default interest gets charged, right? And so that's that's why we're able to turn 10% is a lot of times you might be earning, yeah, 14, 15% at any given time. So um, that actually ends up being a pretty a pretty healthy scenario, uh, frankly, because um, most of the time the defaults can be worked out. Um, but the entry point's always the same. Um, one of the other things we do have, we created a few months ago, uh, was the Stairs app. And the reason we did that is, once once money's in ground floor, it's there, right? Until until the property sells, until the property is refinanced, you're you're in it. Um, so depending on how liquid you need to be, that may not be the greatest scenario for you. And so we went ahead and created Stairs, which is just a high yield savings account is is certainly the best way to describe it. And so uh, money goes in real easy, money comes out easy, and it's anywhere from a four to six percent return. And those are dollars not securitized the same way as the as ground floor is, but um, we utilize we utilize capital coming from that to actually initially fund deals, um, and then once funded, they move to the investment platform, and then you can invest um, in the ground floor platform that is a little more uh, securitized in that regard. But um, but those are kind of the two entry points uh, for us right now. And so then, John, I'd like to kind of revisit. For those of us on the National RIA staff that have children of ages that, you know, we've been contributing to their IRAs all along, but certainly not in huge amounts. Um, but we thought this was, I know there's a lot of creative ways to use small dollar IRAs to invest, but this doesn't take a lot of thought. This, we can go on, we can go to the ground floor app. Um, can you talk to us about using your IRA inside either ground floor itself or would it be possible to loan via the um, stairs app inside that IRA? And is there anything that we need to know about that? Because I know several people got super excited about uh, being able to participate on the call, but we just didn't have enough information on how do we make sure that it's not, um, you know, causing issues to right. be able to, to do that investing. Yep, absolutely. And so this is where we go back to the mechanisms and the, and the alternative vehicles to be able to, to consummate these various transactions, whether it's through ground floor or whatever other type of 
kind of technology platform that you're trying to dial into. Um, and so I'll speak specifically to the ground floor platform. And when you have especially multiple IRAs, and I'm really glad that you, that you brought that up, Rebecca, because one of the things that I spend a lot of time working with investors on is how to create a legacy for their children, their grandchildren, and, and even other family members. And they oftentimes will have five, six, 10. I have one client that has 20 retirement plans and covered L education savings accounts for their children and their grandchildren. And so they have this, call it constellation of family retirement plans. And some of these accounts are, are pretty small in nature. You know, sometimes they only start with, with two to five to $6,000. So for example, with a covered L education savings account, you can only put 2000 in. With a Roth IRA for a child, as long as they have earned income, of course, you can only put $6,000 in that account. And so it might not make sense. You might not be at the, the call it critical mass to be able to go out and deploy that capital and, and make it very meaningful. And so what investors will do is they'll combine multiple IRAs together for a singular transaction. Now, I understand with the ground floor capabilities and opportunities, you could start with a very small amount of money. So I, I think that could be very, very effective on its own. But what I want to share is if you start combining multiple family members' accounts together and you do it in the right way, you can make a really, really big impact for everyone. Now, before I jump into it, I'm going to ask a quick question to Jeff. Um, Jeff, do, does the ground floor technology have the ability to allow a trust, and we'll call it a personal property trust, would it allow a trust to be the investor? Uh, yes. Yes, we do. I can't speak to the, the details of that, but I do know that they allow that. Yes. Okay, perfect. So now that everybody knows that, let me jump back over to, and I should, everybody should see my screen now. And Lori just, or Rebecca, tell me if you can't see it. But now I'm back to this diagram. Now I showed you the LLC diagram before. John, give it a second. It says it started sharing, but it hasn't quite populated yet. Okay. So we're seeing, we're seeing a black screen, but it says you, are, you have started sharing. Okay, I'm going to go back and do it one more time. There you go. Okay. So we're going to skip down here, and I'm going to show you this trust structure. So here's, here's what you're going to consider. You form a personal property trust. Visit your whichever RIA that you are a part of across the country, your, your designated chapter, if you will. And you're likely going to talk to a real estate attorney that knows how to do this type of work. Uh, but I'll also say that there's a lot of very skilled professionals in this industry that work right alongside National RIA. I've met many of these that go on the, they go on the National RIA cruise every year. And I'm sure Rebecca can give you some names. Um, I don't want to put anybody's name out there that, that I shouldn't. So I'll just say, talk to Rebecca, uh, send someone an email and, and they'll, I'm sure, be able to set you up. But they can, they can show you how this, this personal property trust structure works. And so what you do is you set up a personal property trust and you bring in your IRA as the sole beneficiary of that personal property trust. Or what I was talking about a moment ago, you might have multiple beneficiaries. Let me give you an example. Let's say I have an IRA for myself, an IRA for my wife, and then I have Roth IRAs for my three children. And let's use easy numbers here. Let's say we fund this personal property trust with $100,000. And let's say I put in with my IRA, $50,000. My wife with her IRA, she puts in, let's say $40,000. And then we take our two children's Roth IRAs and they each put in $5,000. So within the personal property trust document, we have my IRA at 50% beneficial interest, 
my wife's Roth IRA at 40% beneficial interest, child A at 5%, and child B at 5%. So it's a 50%, 40%, 5%, 5% split. Now, this is really important because we are all disqualified persons to one another. Our IRAs are all disqualified persons to one another. But we make sure that our capital contribution into that trust is proportionate with the beneficial interest, 50, 40, 5, and 5. So now we form a bank account. So we're going to have to get an EIN number. We're going to have to find a bank that will, will allow a bank account in the name of a trust. We also have to have a third-party trustee, non-disqualified person, just like the IRA-owned LLC. So we have a third-party trustee. IRAs are all packed into this trust. Cash is sent from our IRA directly to, or IRAs in this case, because we have multiple Roth IRAs, directly to that personal property trust bank account. From there, we all go in together to transact, whether we're making loans or we're investing through like the ground floor application. Because now the technology between ground floor and the IRA is going to be compatible. The reality is, is self-directed IRA custodians don't have a lot of technological compatibility with these various investing platforms. That has, and that's no discredit whatsoever to the, to the investing platforms and certainly not ground floor. It's not ground floor's fault. It's actually the custodian's fault. They don't have the technology capabilities to be able to do this. So if you go to like a groundfloor.com, for example, or any of these other companies, and you're like, well, why isn't it easier to use your IRA? Why don't you guys make it easier? You, you can't necessarily always blame them. You have to look at the, the custodial industry because the technology just isn't there yet. It hasn't been invented yet. Will it be invented? It probably will be invented in the next few years, but it doesn't exist right now. Keep in mind, a lot of this stuff didn't exist until like 2015 into 16. Remember, the Jobs Act wasn't passed until 2013. So technology and development just hasn't caught up with this stuff yet. And that's why it's a little bit more difficult. But this trust structure that I'm talking about can be highly effective. And then from there, you can, if you want to make a private loan to an investor, you have access to the capital to do that. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you just make sure that all the profits flow back in 50% back into my IRA, 40% back into my wife's, 5% into child A, and 5% into child B. Um, I'll lastly say that this trust structure that I'm showing you here, this isn't something that I came up with on my own. I got to give credit to a number of attorneys that I know very well. I don't want to mention anybody's name out there because I didn't get their permission, but many of them, you all folks probably know on a first name basis. I know Rebecca certainly will. And uh, also our equity trust clients. Uh, I have a local client here in Cleveland. His name is Ron. And Ron actually has 10 IRAs and investment accounts. He has CISA accounts and HSA, a health savings account. He's got his solo 401k. He's got his Roths. So he's got children, grandchildren, and his own accounts. There are 10 investment accounts all in this singular trust. And it's a, it's a private lending trust. And he just makes loan after loan after loan to local real estate investors. So those are all passive investments. So this can be a really great way um, and a very cost-effective way. So you're not forming an LLC. You're, you're simply forming a personal property trust. John, if there aren't multiples, though, and they still want to do this, is the LLC the best way to do that? Uh, so LLC versus personal property trust. Most folks are going to say, and disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, um, and certainly this is not advice, but you'll find that if you want to own physical property, there's obviously liability. And so in that instance, many investors will choose the LLC route. If you're someone that uh, is maybe more interested in just doing private lending or investing through, for example, like ground floor, in that respect, you're likely going to want to just use a personal property trust because you don't have all the liability issues uh, that you would have if you own physical real estate. So great conversation to have with your attorney that's going to be helping you set all this up. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say, look at it from a liability perspective as to whether you use a trust or use an LLC. 
But if you're going to own property, for example, and you want to have multiple members in an LLC, multiple IRAs, the same concept would apply here. The, the, the same process would work. But if they want to invest in ground floor, they want to be able to use that technology, but they're a single individual, they can still go the route of the trust? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. Either we be here at Equity Trust, we would be totally agnostic to it because we're not, we're not going to look at it from a, from a liability or legal perspective. But you know, some investors would get with their attorney and their attorney might say, well, if we're going to own physical real estate, we're going to go the LLC route. But for somebody that just wants to simply do like ground floor, maybe they want to do some private lending, most likely the attorney opinion is going to be go ahead with the personal property trust. Awesome. And Jeff, any parting words? I know these were some of the bigger questions that people had for you in January uh, about being able to effectively and easily um, use their IRA to invest. Any other kind of uh, words of wisdom in using ground floor? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I appreciate you guys having me back. Uh, and I, I appreciate uh, John, you speaking so highly of ground floor and the products we offer. So thank you for that very much. Um, if there are any follow-ups, I'd be more than happy to take them offline. So thank you. Perfect. And then Jeff has put the um, URL for Ground Floor and his email address here in the chat bar. So um, make sure that you reach out to him to be able to connect. Lori has also put a connection if you don't have a local group where you can find one so you can find someone who is knowledgeable about these concepts that can help you. Um, John, let's go back to you. We also talked about being able to do other exciting things inside your IRA that were a little different. Can you talk to uh, talk with us about some of the things that those that are participating with equity have done that might be outside your normal, what most of us would think of as, as quote unquote normal, either by uh, notes, lending, or uh, rental property in an IRA? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the two... Uh... Two types of transactions that that I'm seeing uh, that are that are becoming a little bit more popular and which I haven't seen in the past. The the first is uh, joint ventures, and so um, you know most people on today's call that they, they understand a real estate joint venture. So we don't necessarily get in the need to get in the particulars of that. But what I'll what I'll say and what I'll stress is a lot of investors that I talk to just don't have enough money in their IRA to do the types of deals that they want to do, whether it's a rental or a fix and flip type transaction, or maybe it's a, it's a rent to flip, if you will. So we're going to buy it, we're going to stabilize it, we're going to force appreciation, then we're going to sell it for a profit, turnkey, maybe to like an out-of-state investor. So I'm from the Cleveland market, Cleveland, Ohio. And so we see a lot of out-of-state investors invest here in Cleveland. And so that can be a great opportunity to buy properties, add value, and then sell in, in one and a half to two years to maybe an out-of-state investor or even local investor that's looking for something that's a little bit more turnkey. But the challenge is not having enough money in a singular IRA. So what do we have to do? Well, option A is partner with our non-IRA money or partner with another family member's IRA. But just like I showed you before, there could be limitations there. And then of course we have, you know, some of the prohibited transaction issues that uh, several folks brought up, which I think are very important to consider. But what about, a, what about a real estate joint venture? What, what if we buy a house, we bring in our IRA money, and maybe it's only, let's call it six to $10,000. We certainly want to have some skin in the game. We don't want to do a deal where we only put $100 in with our IRA. We got to have some skin in the game. That's important. But let's say it's six to $10,000. And then we have a money partner, a financial friend, not a spouse, not our non-IRA money, not our LLC, not a child, not a parent a disinterested third party and they come in as our money partner and then we have a contractor and that contractor is the one that's overseeing the entire rehab again we want to be as hands-off as possible so we find a deal we find an opportunity and that's the key we're finding the opportunity we're negotiating we're bringing in a money partner we're creating a joint venture and then the ira is going to receive profit likely in excess of the proportionate capital contribution. For example, some of you have heard me tell the story about uh, Scott and Kate, who are um, members of, of a real estate investor association under the National REA purview. 
<clears throat> and they put a deal together. It's a two hundred twenty-four thousand dollar deal, and Scott was the lead investor. He's the one who found the deal. He put in 24,000 with his Roth IRA. His investor partner, Kate, put in 200,000 and they negotiated a 70-30 split. 70% of the profits went to Scott's Roth and 30% of the profits went to Kate's Roth IRA and HSA. So there are actually three IRAs involved in this joint venture. And they didn't do any of the physical work themselves. They had a third party. That third party was listed in the joint venture agreement. So if there's any questions asked, they have that listed in the joint venture agreement. And Scott ended up, make, Scott ended up making about $42,000 tax-free in his Roth IRA and had $24,000 in the deal. And he did that once. So he did that one time in one year. You want to be careful because you don't want to do too many short-term flips in, in one individual year. So he limits that. But he grew his Roth IRA from $24,000 to $66,000. So it, it's not always a, a sprint, if you will. It's definitely a marathon with growing a retirement plan, especially when you're starting with a small amount of money. But real estate joint ventures can be a great uh, and effective way to do that. And, and I'm seeing a lot more of that activity recently because a lot of investors are becoming more and more intelligent with respect to how to use their IRAs. And there's a lot of motivation because of the potential of potential rising taxes. So a lot of people are looking at and they're saying, okay, I'm getting a little bit older. I need to start growing this account. I need to start hedging against inflation and taxes and the other risks associated with what's going on in the, the overall economy and the financial markets. And then the, the la lastly, the second item, and this one's pretty quick, which is uh, master leasing. Uh, so for example, I have a client here who she, she sort of created the model for an IRA doing these types of master lease agreements. And simply put, many of you are familiar with a master lease, but it is where the IRA enters into a master lease agreement with, with a landlord that, that no longer wants to be a landlord, really, is what it comes down to. That they're, they want to collect a check every month, but they don't want to deal with the, the typical issues that we have to deal with as, as landlords, as many of us probably know and, and can share, uh, can share uh, horror stories and war stories about. And so you find a, a landlord that uh, no longer wants to be a landlord, but wants the monthly checks and your IRA enters into a master lease agreement with them. And so the IRA makes a, makes a monthly, makes the monthly rent payment. And then you turn around after furnishing that property and you lease the property out. Now here's where things get very nuanced. We're not talking about short-term rentals here. We're talking about an average days of rent of anywhere between 60 days to potentially six months. And this is gonna depend on your municipality and the state you're in as well. So we wanna be careful here because obviously we have all kinds of nuances when it comes to, to short-term rentals or you know, call it midterm rentals. But from an IRA perspective, there's a very important reason why people do it this way. And it's so that they don't create a situation where it looks as if their IRA is running a business, which then would trigger a tax called unrelated business income tax. And so this particular investor is renting these properties out for between six months to a year. So these are people that are coming in from out of state. They need temporary residence, might be six months, could be nine months, could even be upwards of a year. And they're turning around and then renting that property out after that, that lease is termed. And these are furnished units. So in other words, they're sort of offering uh, almost like uh, efficiency apartments to these individuals on, uh, I don't want to call it a short-term basis, uh, but I'll call it a shorter-term basis. Uh, so that's master leasing with, with a self-directed IRA, and we're starting to see that increase in popularity as well. Few other questions that we had had previously that um, I have been asked to direct to you um, are: What about investing in a business as long as you're not running it? For example, a startup. Um, and then, what about all the crypto craze? I know that's not exactly directly related to what y'all are doing, but I know you have an arm that that can. So, could you address yep. those two questions for us? Absolutely. So, first question on investing in a business. Can you, invest, can you invest in a business? Short answer, yes. The longer answer, which I need to condense in a very short period of time here, which is, as you could tell already, quite difficult for me, and I think Rebecca and Charles and Ryan know that as well, um, is you have to look at, A, 
do you have any personal involvement? Now, the question was, I don't have any personal involvement. So let's, let's assume that. Um, yes, you can. So if you're just passively investing in a company, great, shouldn't have any issues with that. And even if you had a role as maybe an, an advisor to the board, or maybe you do have a director uh, type seat, uh, it still might be okay. It gets a little gray there. But using the example that the, the individual mentioned, if you don't have any personal involvement, you're just passively investing, shouldn't have any issues. The bigger issue, maybe not bigger issue, but the issue that I spend more time talking about is if you're investing in a business that is taxed as a pass-through, for example, if you invest in an LLC or a limited partnership and it's being taxed as a pass-through, not a corporation, but taxed as a pass-through, and that business is generating ordinary business income, then your IRA becomes subject to a tax called unrelated business income tax, UBIT tax for short. And it can be pretty nasty. It could be 37% for income over $13,100 roughly. That being said, some people can actually justify it. Not necessarily nasty, just something that you have to understand and you got to pencil it out and determine if it makes financial sense. Lastly, if it's a corporation structure, so if it's taxed as a corporation and then the income flows through as dividend income, then you don't have to worry about UBIT tax. Some people actually creatively structure their entity as an LLC tax as a corporation with their IRA invested in that entity. Then they go out and do UBIT generating activities and the corporation pays 21% corporate tax at the federal level. You got to factor in state as well. And then the income flows through to the IRA. So instead of paying a 37% tax, you're paying you know, all in with state and federal you know, 21 to, to whatever that percentage might be. Could potentially be upwards of 30%, but certainly you're probably going to be less than 37%. And so that's called a blocker corporation, uh, probably for another discussion, of course. But uh, for all intents and purposes, you want to look at the tax nature of the business before you invest. And then, of course, what's your personal involvement to make a decision on whether it makes sense for your IRA. Lastly, on the cryptocurrency, uh, you are correct, Rebecca. We do have a, a back office, if you will, solution for cryptocurrency investing. What that means is if you want to invest in cryptocurrency with your IRA, you have the, the ability to do it through one of our preferred crypto dealers. So you could come to Equity Trust. In fact, right now you could go to investmentdistrict.com and you can shop for a crypto dealer that you would link up with. They would help you open an IRA. They would help you fund your IRA. And then Equity Trust offers all the back office technology solutions for you to be able to transact in the cryptocurrency marketplace. Uh, so you're doing this directly through your IRA, you're using a portal which handles everything from the purchase to the settlement to the storage of the cryptocurrency. That's a major issue with self-directed IRAs right now, which is the security component of it. Uh, there was a firm, of course, I would never mention the name, uh, but there was a firm out there that was breached um, I don't know what the resolution of that is, but I know there's great concern with regard to that. A lot of sympathy for the industry because it is very challenging to um, sort of keep security at the, the highest level in the crypto markets. And so we do have a solution that has, if you will, the utmost security features and cold storage capability so that we are mitigating the risk of any type of breach to the self-directed IRAs owning cryptocurrency. So if you want to invest in crypto with your IRA, um, you can reach out to us via investmentdistrict.com and you can find one of our cryptocurrency dealer partners that work in that space and we would be the back office support. So you'd still see our name and information. John, thanks so much for that. I know there were a lot of complicated questions and we appreciate your patience and answers for those today. Um, it's an exciting time. There's things that are available to us that never were before, but it's also an interesting time based on, you know, changes in tax law and changes in things that are happening in the economy. So we appreciate your updates and uh, insight into some of those things. Absolutely. And I welcome and appreciate the challenging questions from everyone. So always glad to be on these calls. 
and keep the challenging questions coming because those are the types of questions that I find create a lot of unique investment creativity and uh, ultimately create a roadmap for you know future investors to come. So thank you again, Rebecca, Ryan, and Charles, as always. And as always, if there's anything I can do for you guys and all of the members on the call, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'll make sure I post my email in the uh, inbox in case anyone needs to reach out. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And just a quick plug for the appreciation we have with equity at what they've extended as a benefit to our members, that gold level service program uh, that you get with your first year with an account through National RIA um, with equity provides that gold level service and the questions that you can ask the service that you get there is incredible and it's one of the things that when we were negotiating um, that benefit was very important to us at national that we built that in because especially as a new ra investor you'll have a lot of questions and so being able to have that uh the gold level service has been incredible for us personally and uh, for our members to be able to use. So thanks to all of you so much on the call. I hope you're experiencing finally some spring. We're getting a little bit of it here in Ohio uh, and hope to by next month have some sunshine behind us while we're while we're doing these uh, sessions. Have a really terrific weekend and uh, we will see you then back here. Same place, same time next month. Bye bye all.